throughout his life, the one thing that meant most to Jesus was people. He sacrificed everything to lead them to his Father and to love them no matter what. Jesus loved everyone. That was what made him so different and so necessary to our lives. I'm John Osteen, pastor of Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. Through many years of ministry, we've discovered that there's no greater joy than loving and caring for God's people. That means you, no matter your denomination, race, or walk of life. Your dreams and desires are important to God, and that makes them important to us. We've dedicated our lives to bringing the compassion of Jesus to everyone. By building faith in God through the teaching and preaching of His Word, Lakewood helps those who have been overcome to be overcomers. We're interested in God's very best for you. So please, just as you are, join the people of Lakewood for the next hour as we open God's Word together. At Lakewood Church, we're here for you. Well, praise the Lord. We're so glad you've tuned in today. You know, we have a good time here at Lakewood Church. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And we just invite you to come out and enjoy some of that joy. Could I have an amen? Amen. I want to just give you a scripture very quickly about uh, something that really <clears throat> spoke to my heart in uh, the book of 2 Kings. Jehu was a king, and he was talking to another man, and he said to this man, I'm loyal to you. It, and this, is in the essence, this is the essence of it. I'm loyal to you, but here are the words he said in the King James Version. Is your heart right as my heart is turned toward your heart? Now you think about that. We are an example to people, and if we're looking to people, and I thought about mothers and daddies, is your heart right? Is your heart toward God? Or is it turned toward somebody else? Because your children are looking at you and saying, where's your heart, mother and daddy? How's it turned? Because I'm looking to you, and my heart's turned like your heart is turned. So I just want to encourage you, be good Christians. Love God. Those of you who are not saved, turn your heart right today. Get your heart right with God. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you need to make the decision so your heart will be turned right toward God. Then when people look at you, their heart will be turned right because yours, theirs is turned toward you. And all the people said, Amen, amen. amen. Thank you, Dodie. That's real good. <clears throat> you know, I want to I want to remind the television audience today we're going to be speaking on the Holy Spirit. And uh, Paul said to the people in the 19th chapter he, of Acts, he said, uh, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed it? They said, we haven't even heard whether there be a Holy Spirit. Well, that's one reason we talk about this on television. A lot of Christians do not know about the power of the Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you, it's wonderful to be filled and baptized with the Holy Ghost. And... Uh, you know, we want to encourage you that you have a mighty helper, a great helper, and you don't have to face life alone with all of the ups and downs and troubles and sorrows. The Holy Ghost can come and be a mighty helper to you in every situation. He knows all things. He can reveal things to you. He will guide you. So stay tuned. Lift up our Bibles and let's make our confession. Everybody say, it. this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Television audience, we're reading from the book of John, chapter 14. And Jesus said in verse 14 of chapter 14, If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, 
and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and he shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, or as orphans, I will come to you. Talking about the Holy Ghost. And we're talking in these days to the local church here and also to you who view by television on the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus spent so much time when he started to talk about going away, talking about the Holy Ghost. And uh, he thought it was so important to the church because he was going away, but he was going to send the Holy Ghost back to direct the affairs of the church. And uh, somehow there is a great uh, antagonism, even in religious areas, when you start talking about the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire. Uh, uh, some people say, well, don't, don't talk to me about the Holy Ghost. I remember as an ordained Southern Baptist minister, and I'm still ordained Southern Baptist minister, and I thank God for the Baptists. Thank God for all they do. Everybody say, God bless the Baptists. Say it out loud. You know, thank God for everybody who's getting people saved and doing some good. But I didn't have any light. They didn't teach me about the baptism in the Holy Ghost and, you know, that I could speak in other tongues and that I could have uh, the fullness of the Holy Ghost. In fact, they taught me to stay away from people like you. <laughs> that, that all of this was just an emotional experience. And I believe that with all of my heart. But Jesus said, you know that I'm going to send to the church and to individuals the Holy Ghost. He'll be another comforter. He'll be the power of God in your life. Have you ever wondered why so many religious people are against the baptism in the Holy Ghost? It's because the devil knows that that's the power of God. And if he can keep them from the power of God, he can keep victory out of their life. Now, all Christians who are born again have the Holy Ghost. Because I, I remember as a denominational preacher, they'd come to me and say, you need the Holy Ghost. It'd make me mad because I knew I was born of the Spirit. Just make me mad. Make me think that, that I didn't know anything about God. And really hurt my pride <laughs> to, to, for them to tell me that, you know, that I needed something else. And so I grew up for 19 years in my ministry afraid to touch anything that had to do with what people call the baptism in the Holy Ghost. But yet Jesus, the head of the church, is the one who said, I'm going away so the Holy Ghost can come. He called the Holy Ghost a helper. Thank God for the helper. Now, just because you're born of the Spirit of God doesn't mean you're full of the Holy Ghost. When you're born again, that qualifies you then to receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost. You say, well, I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost when I got saved. No, you didn't. The Bible says the world cannot receive the Holy Ghost. How many of you, when you didn't serve Jesus, know you were of the world? Shout amen. amen. See, you were of the world. You cannot receive the Holy Ghost as a lost person. You can receive Jesus into your heart, and the Holy Ghost can give you the new birth. But now the Bible says a lot about receiving the Holy Ghost. Who's that for? That's for somebody who has been born again, washed in the blood. And somebody said, well, I sure don't want to speak in tongues. Why not? We don't get mad when people speak German. We don't get mad when people speak Russian around us. Why should we get mad if God, who made all languages, will give us a supernatural language to communicate with heaven? It's unnatural. The antagonism against what they call, quote, quote, speaking in tongues. You know, years ago, I won't tell this on Doty. We were in that little building. Y'all know what I'm going to tell? Uh, we were in that little building over there, and we were having, we'd turn on the map, you know, for world evangelism, and we'd stretch out our hands toward the map, and we'd pray, you know, and, and so Dodie got up, she was just, just getting used to getting up, you know, before the people, you know, and, and, and exercising her ministry, you know, and she was real concerned and real, real moved about missions, and she said, I want everybody to stand. 
And she meant to say, stretch out your hands toward the map and pray in tongues. And she said, I want everybody to stretch out your tongues toward the map. <laughs> and Dodie started crying because everybody started laughing. And Dodie just stood in the pulpit and cried. And I jumped up and I said, number one, I said, let's take five minutes to laugh. So we all laugh for five minutes. I said, now there's a little dark cloud on Dodie's head. I said, let's all knock it off because I've got to drive home with her. <laughs> so we knocked the dark cloud off and we went on with the service. And so get, I got in the car, I said to Dodie, we're going home, Dodie had cooked, got up about five o'clock that morning, cooked a full meal like she normally did, you know, and, and we, we had all the kids in the car and we were going home and, and, and uh, we got in the car and I said, now don't say a word. Don't bring up that subject. It's over with, done with, gone forever. Don't even mention it. So we went on and we had lunch. And Dodie stopped washing dishes or whatever she was doing, walked over there and she said, can I say one thing? I said, well, just one. She said, there's a little boy came up to me and said, uh, Dodie, she said, I want to ask you a question. She said, what? She said, how far out were we to stretch our tongues? <laughs> but, you, but you know, you know, the Bible says, he that speaks in another tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him. How be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries to God. And one translation says, divine secrets. I don't know about you, but I like this idea of speaking divine secrets. Stand up, Tim and Ruth. Put the camera on them. We were having a staff prayer meeting. And they, they've always wanted a child. They haven't had, had a child yet, but they're going to have a child. But we were in the staff prayer meeting. I wasn't there, but the staff was there. And they were praying. And the power of the Holy Ghost came. And they were praying strong in other language. Now, Justin, my son here, and Slava, and, and Didi, they all understand Russian. And uh, they, they, they walked in when Tim was greatly moved to pray in other tongues. And he was saying a, one phrase, one sentence, over and over and over again. And these people that understand Russian were electrified because he was speaking perfect Russian to God. And you know what he was saying? Out of the depths of his being, he was crying in Russian, I want a son, I want a son, I want a son, I want a son. I believe he's going to get a son. You see, God heard the secrets of his heart. You cannot tell God how much you love him or all your problems and all your needs in your human language. You can't do it. You run out of language. So God gives you the opportunity to pray not in your mind, but in your spirit. And when you run out of your normal language, if it's English, you run out of English, the Holy Ghost takes over and you begin to pray in heavenly languages. And you know, I was against that. I, I really was. I, I, didn't, I didn't think there was anything to that. I, you know, I'd been taught really, I hate to say this, but I'd been taught it was of the devil. Anybody ever hear that? Two things I remember being taught. One, speaking in tongues was of the devil and that all these people are supposed to have been healed by these evangelists and, and people praying for the sick. They were all paid to say they were sick and paid to say they were healed. Anybody ever hear that? That's an old lie. The devil's gone around all over the world. But anyway, I, I didn't have, uh, you know, I didn't have much uh, love toward this idea of speaking in tongues. And yet I knew I needed power from God. Why should it seem incredible to anybody in the world that God could give you a heavenly language? He can. He's a helper. The Holy Ghost comes in 
When you receive the Holy Ghost after being saved, you get a heavenly language, and that's how you know that you have received the fullness of the Holy Ghost. And then the supernatural gifts of the Holy Ghost begin to operate in your life. Now, I was down in the dark, dark hole of tradition. I was bound by a thousand chains. All the doctrine, all the teaching of my college and seminary days had bound me up. And I was thoroughly convinced that there was nothing to all of this, even though the Bible's full of it. I had on my denominational glasses. I had my ears, denominational ears, plugged up. And, and I just read the Bible with denominational glasses on and just glanced over that. It's all done away with. It's not for today. I don't have any help for today. There's no Holy Ghost power today. And I lived that way for 19 years. I wonder how I did it. But one day, I got to associate with a assembly of God man. Dangerous. <laughs> I was pastor of the Baptist Church in Baytown, Texas. He was pastor over there at Cedabao. Jenkins Woods is his name. And he was, he was pastor of the First Assembly of God in, in uh, Cedabao. He's still over there. 125,000 years old, I guess. <laughs> but he's still over there. If you hear this, Jenkins, I didn't mean that. But anyway, we, were, we would eat breakfast together or lunch together, and this happened to be a breakfast on a Monday morning, and uh, you know, he'd tell about his service, I'd tell about my service. I was always glad because I had more than he had. I had a much bigger church than he had. See, I was in the book of Numbers. When I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I got out of the book of Numbers and got in the book of Acts. It's not how many you got, it's how much power you got as you get there. Amen. So anyway, we were sitting there talking, and uh, you know, he never would just try to choke the baptism of the Holy Ghost down me. But he said, you know, Brother Osteen, he said, we had a wonderful service yesterday. He said, uh, there was a little girl in our service, about 11, 12 years old, 10, 11, 12 years old, and she just rose up and began to give a message in other tongues. I, my own thinking now was this. You've heard me tell this many times. I thought in my mind while he was telling me this, poor child. She'll be in a mental institution. Sure is shooting. She'll be in a mental institution. She'll lose her mind. Now, that's why I thought. That's the way I was taught. And then uh, he kept on talking because he didn't know what I was thinking. And he said, and there was a missionary home on leave, on furlough from Africa, Brother McCorkle, who lives in this area now, I believe. He, he's retired. He stood up in the congregation went to the front and said, congregation, this child is speaking in the language of the tribe that I minister to in Africa, and here's what she's saying. I want you to know, I nearly choked to death on what I was eating. <laughs> it was the first time in all of my ministry that I ever came face to face with the supernatural gifts of the Holy Ghost. That was the gift of tongues, not the prayer language that no man understands. That's the gift of tongues. And did you know when he told me that, it seemed like in the dark hole of tradition, bound by a thousand chains, I couldn't get out. I knew there was light somewhere, but I couldn't get out. But when he told me that, it seemed like every chain broke. And I came out of that dark hole. I saw there was reality to what they had told me was of the devil. I came out of that dark hole with every chain broken, and I sent my heart to seek the face of God. I said, oh God, if there's power to be had in this generation, I'm going to find it. I'm going to climb the hill of God. I'm going to get above the fog and smog of this world and above the tradition of man and teaching of man. I'm going to climb up there and wrap my fingers in the garments of God. And my cry is, I'll not be shaken off. I need the power of God in this generation. Hell is too hot. Heaven is too real. Time is too short. Eternity is too long to fail. God, I want to I wanna be a success for God in my generation. And I cried out. 
I didn't care what anybody uh, said about me. I didn't care who it separated me from or identified me with. I set my face to seek for the power of the living God. I saw that I had the same right that Peter and James and John and all the apostles had to have the baptism in the Holy Ghost, to have a helper. I was not to be as an orphan in a storm, forlorn and destitute, without any power, laughed at by the devil. I wanted power. And I set myself to seek the Lord, and I was free to do that. And I tell you, I began to seek, and I began to seek, and there were no charismatics back there then. I tell you, there were just denominational people and Pentecostal people, and. And I went to the Pentecostals, and they nearly scared me to death. God bless the Pentecostals. Amen. But, I, you know, I got the idea from them that you had to get your wife to take off all of her earrings and all of her bracelets and all of her hairdo and all of her makeup. And I had seen her without makeup. I mean, real strange. I, I didn't want to get dotty in that. Let me tell you something. It's not the outside God looks on. It's the inside. Listen to this scripture. We have received not the spirit of bondage to fear. The Holy Ghost is not a spirit of bondage. We don't have to obey the laws of man that they made with their religious rules. The Holy Ghost is a spirit of liberty. Amen. Oh, my. I think about, you know, Lazarus is dead, just like we were dead in sins. Jesus stood before that grave, and he said, roll away the stone. And he cried out, Lazarus, come forth. And uh, he was brown, hand and foot. I don't know how he got out. Of the, the Holy Ghost just lifted him up and brought him out. He's alive. He's got those grave clothes on him. You know, that's how I, I, it seemed like I was. I had been dead in sins according to Ephesians 2, and Jesus had called me out of death, and I was alive, but I still had on the grave clothes. I couldn't dance because I was wound up. I couldn't lift my hands because they're bound up. I couldn't talk in tongues because a napkin was across my face. But Jesus said, loose him and let him go. And you know, that's what I've been doing ever since. I've been loosing people. Oh, some of you are so bound, you can't put your hands up in the air to praise God. Oh, it makes you nervous. Some of you can't do a little dance for Jesus. Oh, some of you can't speak in tongues and magnify the Lord. But I'm telling you, we need the denominational world with all of the good things that they have. We need to unwrap the grave clothes and we need to take the napkin off of the face. We need the church filled with the power of God. Amen. Oh, we need that. I'm thinking about that little donkey that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Did you know, according to the Old Testament, that that little donkey was living because it had been redeemed? It says when, when a foal of a colt like that is born, if you don't offer a sacrifice, you've got to break his neck. They'd offered a sacrifice, and that little donkey was the saved donkey. <laughs> he was a redeemed donkey. And, uh, and they found this little donkey tied to a post. And they came to him and started loosening him. They said, what are you doing losing that donkey? He said, the master has need of him. That little donkey is destined to carry Jesus into Jerusalem. And you know, I was like that. I'm not going to say this about anybody else. I was like that. I was a redeemed donkey. But I was tied to my post my denominational post, and I could see green grass out there, but my rope wouldn't reach that far. I could see a little extra supernatural over here, but my rope wouldn't lead that, reach that far. And I could see healing over here, but my rope wouldn't reach that far. I was tired. But Jesus said, loose him. Woo! 
I would have lived and died in a denominational camp never amounting to a hill of beans, but thank God I was destined to take Jesus to the nations of the world, and I never could have done it unless I'd have gotten loose. And you have a destiny, preacher. You have a destiny, deacon. You have a destiny, man or woman. And I'll tell you, you need to be loose in the Holy Ghost to fulfill the will of God for your life. Oh, hallelujah. It said that that little donkey was tied where two ways met. The way of the world and the religious world are the way of God's perfect will. I mean, you got to make a choice. Oh, my, I've got such good news for you. Listen, people, God's not going to take anything away from you. He's going to add something to you. You're going to have signs and wonders and miracles and fulfill the will of God for your life. Throw your pride away and arise and go to Jesus. I'm talking about Holy Ghost and... Oh, that's what we need. And somebody said to me, got me privately, said, you've ruined your ministry. You'll never have anybody to preach to. Never have anybody to preach to. Well, just look at this audience. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Look at them. Look at this audience. Thousands and thousands of people. And another thousand outside in the children's building, about a thousand people. In the children's building, just think about a thousand people. And we're reaching over a hundred nations of the world because we're free to believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we have the baptism in the Holy Ghost in fire. And we speak in tongues. And we pray for the sick and we cast out devils. Somebody said, well, you will never amount to anything. You'll lose your ministry. Well, thank God I found my ministry. Amen. And you, can't, you can't imagine, businessman, businesswoman, housewife, whoever you are, you can't imagine the change that will come into your life, how real God will become when you make Jesus not only your Savior but the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Now, the greatest experience, of course, is to make Jesus the Lord of your life. And we want to meet you in heaven. And we want you to pray this prayer. If there's any doubt about your salvation, you may have your name on a church roll someplace, but you may not know for sure that you're born again. Many of you know that you're not because you're living in the world. And you think, well, God wouldn't have anything to do with somebody like me. But listen, Christ died for sinners. He died for you. And he wants you. He loves you. If you'd have been the only one in the world that was lost, he would have died for you. So simply pray this prayer. The Bible said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's call. While the audience here is real quiet, you just say these words. Say, oh, God, I know I'm a sinner. You know I'm a sinner. But God, today I turn my back on the way I've been living. I'll never go back. Never, never, never. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, and I ask you right now, Jesus, I open wide the door of my heart. Come in. Come in and be my Lord and be my Savior. I surrender my life to you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. You belong to me, and I belong to you, and I won't act like it didn't happen.